Hello and welcome to the FedWatch podcast. This is a new podcast here at the Mises Institute. And this is a podcast we'll be doing pretty regularly every other week, at least once a month, here to look specifically at the Federal Reserve, how the Federal Reserve does business, what uh, does current Fed policy mean for you and for the economy overall, and really just look at some of the nuts and bolts and some of the people uh, behind Fed policy and what's going on there, also some history of the Fed, and really just give you a more in-depth idea of how it all works and why it's important. And joining me today, and who I hope will be joining me pretty often on the podcast, is Alex Pollack. Now, Alex is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. He's got at least three books, uh, all on the Fed and on business cycles. His most recent book is Surprised Again, the COVID Crisis and the New Market Bubble. Uh, and he's he's got a pretty great uh, resume in terms of this sort of policy. He's previously uh, been the principal deputy director for the Office of Financial Research in the U.S. Treasury Department. He was a distinguished senior fellow at the R Street Institute, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and president and CEO of and CEO of Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. Did that for quite a while, from 91 to 2004. And so it's great that uh, he's now joined us at the Mises Institute to really cover in detail a lot of Fed policy and just a real practical nuts and bolts look at what the Fed's going on or doing at any given time. And so today I wanted to start off with some of the basics of what the Fed is doing. Not too basic, uh, but something that's relevant and suddenly has become very relevant in modern times and which uh, you probably, <laughs> I think the title surprised again is relevant here, right? This is the sort of thing that we were told for years would never be an important issue and just didn't matter. And that's the issue of the Fed balance sheet and Fed remittances. And you've done a few articles for us uh, on this and also for uh, other publications as well, mainstream publications. And so, Alex, maybe you can start off by just telling us a little bit first about what is this Fed balance sheet? And the Fed is a bank of sorts, and it actually matters what assets they have. I mean, what's the story there? Well, the Fed is a bank, or it's 12 banks, to be exact. It is the Federal Reserve System, uh, originally conceived as 12 regional banks who are going to have a fair amount of independence from each other. That went away in the course of the Fed's evolution. But it is 12 banks. We can add those 12 banks together. Uh, and they are all banks. They are banks. They are special banks. They have special powers. Uh, they can print money. They are now the monopoly money printer. In uh, in history, regular banks also printed money. You could walk around with a uh, $5 bill in your pocket from the uh, Fourth State Bank of Skunk Creek or something. But the Fed uh, monopolized that uh, starting 100 years ago or so. Uh, but, it, but the Federal Reserve banks do have balance sheets. We add them all up into one consolidated Federal Reserve balance sheet. Uh, and when you do that, you get the biggest by far bank in the United States uh, today with total assets of about $8.5 trillion, an enormous and previously unimaginable sum. Some years ago, I was talking to a quite brilliant and distinguished economist colleague of mine, and I said, well, uh, if we look at the Fed's balance sheet, and he said, does the Fed have a balance sheet? And he was serious. But I said, I, being a banker, not an economist, said, of course it does. Uh, it is a financial entity, and all central banks have balance sheets. So let's talk a little bit about this amazing $8.5 trillion balance sheet. The Fed makes investments 
just like any bank or any investment fund, the investments they make are principally U.S. Treasury securities. And uh, over the last 13 years, they have also bought mortgage securities, mortgage-backed securities, which was a radical and, in my view, if not quite temporary, then absolutely mistaken uh, move that they made. But they now own about uh, five and a half trillion dollars of Treasury securities and about two and a half trillion dollars of mortgage securities on their balance sheet. Now, these are investments and they earn interest. And then the Fed has deposits. It's a bank. It has deposits from banks. It has deposits from the Treasury Department. And it also borrows money uh, from the market, principally from money market funds in the form of what are called repurchase agreements, which are simply borrowings that it collateralizes with its uh, Treasury securities. And it has capital, or at least it had capital uh, in the past tense. Um, the Fed's capital on the books adds up to $42 billion. You can see that uh, if you think banks in general ought to have 5 or 10 percent capital compared to their assets, the Fed has roughly one half percent capital, or it's leveraged, as we'd say, in finance, 200 to 1. Uh, but that's just the book capital, which is no longer there, uh, because the Fed has also lost money in the last eight months, it's lost $62 billion. Well, let me give you some easy arithmetic. If you started off with $42 billion of capital and you lost $62 billion, what's your capital? It's negative $20 billion. Uh, and that's not counting the mark to market, which maybe you want me to come back to, Ryan. Uh, so we have this really interesting, gigantic balance sheet gigantic bank, uh, which historically always made money, always made money because the income from its investments was always greater than the costs of its liabilities, most of which were zero because most of which were money you print up and you don't pay interest on that. Took this money, and this is where the remittance comes in, took its profits and sent them to the U.S. Treasury, and that's income to the Treasury, and it's a reduction. If the Treasury is running a deficit, as it has been uh, for a very long time, that's a reduction of the deficit. Well, now the income on the Federal Reserve's investments is less than the cost of its liabilities and the costs of its deposits and borrowings. And the Fed, as I said, is losing money on an operating basis. This is, this is cash out the door. It's losing money at the rate of something in excess of $8 billion a month. It's, it looks like it's headed for, in a year, losing $100 billion. This is a nice big round number, $100 billion. And, uh, and this, again, is an operating loss, a cash loss, where the cash is gone and will never come back. Um, and so when you're losing money, it can't pay the Treasury any money because it doesn't have any profits to pay over. So the Treasury does not have this offset, and its, and its deficit is correspondingly bigger. Well, that's a, an interesting and historically unprecedented uh, situation, and, and it happened because the Federal Reserve made its own balance sheet uh, into a gigantic interest rate risk speculation, where they own very long fixed rate assets, that is to say long bonds and mortgages, which are mostly 30-year mortgages, and they're earning, on average, on those these days, 2%. And on their deposits and borrowings, they are paying about 
So think about this. If your income is 2% and your expenses are 5%, what do you think happens? Well, it's hard to make money that way. And so the Fed, over the 12 months, you know, uh, from last September to next September, which would be a government fiscal year, is going to lose something like $100 billion. $100 billion. And, and this uh, all reflects the uh, the balance sheet that they consciously created in order to suppress both short-term and long-term interest rates to abnormal lows. If you want to get interest rates down, you just buy the you, you keep buying the um, you keep buying the assets and that pushes their price up and their yield down. Uh, and so the Fed created this, you might say, financial trap for itself, which has re resulted in its losses. And uh, many uh, people have said, well, look at the failure of these banks lately. Uh, what did they do? Well, they bought long-term fixed-rate assets, and they financed them short, and they ended up with assets earning maybe 2 or 3% and liabilities costing 5%. They went broke. So you might say, well, they should be criticized for that. But how could the Fed reasonably criticize these banks for doing exactly the same thing that the Federal Reserve itself did? That seems interesting <laughs> to me. Well, I, I think uh, that's that's the key issue here, too, is that just for people who are watching the bank failure issue unravel in real time, it's essentially the same interest rate mismatch issue, it sounds like, at both the Fed and at regular banks. Yes, and I, I hear I describe the Fed as the Pied Piper, which led the banks into taking these highly risky, and, it, and it's hardly new, Everybody has known for hundreds of years that this is a way to get into trouble, investing, investing long, borrowing short, as we say. And you get in trouble that way both in interest rate risk terms, because when interest rates rise, uh, then as we were saying for both these failed banks and for the Federal Reserve, the cost of the deposits become, becomes to exceed the income you're making uh, on your on your assets, on your investments, and then uh, and then you're losing money. Now, if you're a private bank, you then go broke, and you are closed down. If you're the Fed, well, all you do is print up some more money to cover your own expenses. So the Fed is now printing money uh, to pay its own expenses and to pay interest on its own deposits to the extent that those uh, exceed its income, which they do to the tune of of $100 billion per year the, the, at this point. Now, um, something else, as interest rates rise, uh, as you all know, uh, the market price of, of long-term assets falls. So the price of the long uh, treasury bonds and of the mortgage-backed securities that the Fed bought, I'm reminding you, Five and a half trillion of treasury bonds, um, which are on average very long, about one and a half trillion are have more than 10 years left to run, more than 10 years left to run. And the mortgages all have more than 10 years left to run, at least contractually. They, they may pay off earlier, but they're very long. Uh, and then, so the market value of both the bonds and the mortgages falls. And then you, if you mark those to market, you just say, well, here are these securities I own. What's their current market price? And uh, what if I uh, had to sell some of them today? Of course, you never could sell all of them today because the Fed tried to sell its whole $8 trillion of assets that would just crash the market. It couldn't, it couldn't be done. They can't. So this is important to remember. They cannot be sold. But if you were selling small, you know, reasonable market-sized amounts of them, say $10 million or, dollars or so, uh, what would the price be? And then we call that a mark-to-market. So you take your portfolio, mark-to-market, just the same uh, as you do if you own stocks. 
say, well, that's nice. I bought this for $100 a share. What's it trading for today? 80? Okay, my mark to market is $80. That's a $20 loss. Well, when you do the same thing with the Fed's own investments, uh, it turns out that their mark to market loss by their own reckoning is about $1 trillion. So the operating loss is so far 62 billion, a rate of 100 billion a year. But the mark to market loss is one trillion. Uh, I mean, that would get your attention. <laughs> That's still real money. Even a hundred billion is still real money. And and you yeah. noted that, right? <laughs> I mean, we're talking yeah. about defense spending altogether is official at Pentagon specifically. We're talking about eight hundred billion. So a hundred billion. That's yeah. That's that's not nothing. And that's what we're talking about in terms of Fed losses. This is money that the Federal Reserve has actually lost the U.S. government. Well, so one of the things uh, the Fed is often uh, thought of in, in sort of a mystical way by people as this uh, special organization that's going to, as, as they say, manage the economy. It's going to set interest rates at the right level. It's going to decide how much inflation there should be and then create that much inflation. Uh, all these things assume that the Fed knows what no one can know. That is how the future of markets will develop. No one can know that. And the Fed can't know it either. And we see that uh, very clearly when we look at the forecast the Fed makes. And guess what? The Federal Reserve's economic and interest rate and inflation forecasts are equally as bad as everyone else's. Say as bad as mine, which are terrible. And so is everybody's because uh, uh, this is a bigger uh, uh, issue that I, we won't get into today, but because the financial and economic future in an enterprising market economy, like we still have uh, to an to a large extent, although not as much as we should, uh, is unknown. But more than unknown, it's unknowable. And no one can know it. And the Fed can't know it either. So as a small example of this, I like to point out that um, if you uh, look at the interest rate forecasts done by the Fed in June 2021, for the end of the year 2022, now interest rates, short-term interest rates at the end of 2022 were about four and a half, four and a half percent. What do you think the Fed forecast? Do you know, Ryan, what the Fed forecast? Well, I've, I, I do look at their, uh, their uh, economic report that they put out several times a year, their forecast report. Did they, let's say they predicted two and a half percent. You're wrong. Oh, okay. They predicted <laughs> one quarter of one percent. Oh. 25, 25 <laughs> Way basis points. Oh, was, wow. You, know, you might it's say. even worse than I thought. That was a, that was a really amazing miss. <laughs> um, for the end of 2023, they predicted 1.75 percent, I believe it was. No, they did completely, completely. So they have no idea. Well, and of course, they off, they always predict a rosy picture, too. Sure. So if they're predicting unemployment is going to be at 6%, well, I just assume it's going to be considerably higher than that. And now with Fed economists saying, oh, well, we should expect a mild recession later this year. Well, that, that sets off alarm bells for me because when they got even the beige book saying, oh, yeah, things are slowing down, things don't look good. I mean, normally the standard language for these sorts of publications is things are moderately growing, things are relatively strong, things are great, things are pretty good. And the banks are sound and, and resilient, they're saying, <laughs> right. in spite of the fact we just had some notable failures and failures that they, they felt compelled to declare were systemically important, which meant they, that the whole system was at risk because of these failures. Tells you. All right, so uh, so the Fed, I have this little story. Uh, so the Fed completely missed, you know, missed by a factor of uh, 40 or so on the interest rates for, for the end of 2022. 
They completely missed, as we know, on inflation with their famous. First of all, they didn't anticipate the extent of the inflation. Then, of course, there was their famous uh, inaccurate transitory call. And they completely failed to anticipate the banking system problems that came up. So one, two, three, that's three strikes. So if you recall one of my favorite poems, which is Casey at the Bat. Not only did mighty Casey strike out, but the Fed, mighty Fed, struck out. Three strikes on these forecasts. But I don't, you know, I don't criticize them for this because to ask them to know the future is to ask them to do what can't be done. The, the, the people who make a mistake are the people who are asking the Fed, or if the Fed, it might be the Fed themselves who are asking themselves to do what can't be done. That is to say, know the unknowable future and manipulate it. That's, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not what we need. I actually, uh, you, did, you nicely mentioned my books. Thank you, Ryan. I have another book called uh, uh, Finance and Philosophy, Why We're Always Surprised. That, that, then that one was followed by Surprised Again, and my co-author said we, we need to write another one called Surprised Yet Again. But anyway, Why We're Always Surprised. That, that, the Finance and Philosophy, Why We're Always Surprised, is a chapter in it which your listeners might be interested in. It's called the most dangerous financial institution in the world. And they says, who is the most dangerous financial institution in the world? And it says, well, it's the Federal Reserve. They have a lot of power, but they have tremendous power combined uh, with the idea that they should know things that they can't know. And that combination is really dangerous. Now, you might get it right, you know, and you, you might do something that's needed and good, but you might also make terrific mistakes and set off huge inflation, set off bubble, asset price bubbles as they have, which later correct uh, into, uh, into busts and, and uh, uh, help the uh, government rob the savers uh, of any real return of their savings, uh, depreciate the currency, uh, and, and and contribute to the crises that they they claim to be preventing. All this, all these things make them, uh, in my opinion, the most dangerous information, the most dangerous uh, financial institution in the world. And I always think of the the movie The Wizard of Oz when it comes to the Fed. If you remember the classic line, "Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain." <laughs> I would say that's a good that yeah that's a good uh, uh, description of how the Fed works. Although the Fed was was forced about <laughs> I don't know twelve years ago to start having some level of transparency with their regular press conferences. And if you if you read Fed materials, like since I'm in the the tenth uh, Fed district, I get their magazine. I think it's a monthly magazine. Uh, the, the the local yes bank. Yeah. the Kansas City Fed. Yeah. And I think it's called yeah. 10 is their magazine. And I don't know how the other feds do it. Because they're the 10th. They all, they all have yes. such a thing. In, in I assume history. so. And I wonder if the rhetoric is all similar, too, which is every article or every issue begins with some introductory remarks about how the Fed is very responsive and it has all of these member banks and they're they're uh, they're answerable to the people and local needs and desires through um, through their membership system. This isn't a unified central bank. It's like they're they're trying to reiterate all these old debates from the nineteen teens and twenties. Yeah, it, it is said that Carter Glass, who was one of the fathers of the Federal Reserve Act of nineteen thirteen, uh, later on. Uh, when he was a chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, he used to ask witnesses in the 1920s, does the United States have a central bank? And the answer he wanted was no, it has a federal system of regional reserve banks. That's what you're talking about. And that was the original idea, but it hasn't been the idea for a long time. The Federal Reserve now thinks of itself 
as and is in fact a centralized uh, a centralized central bank for a, a unified central bank run uh, from Washington. Now the, the Federal Reserve Bank presidents do get a vote and they do get a say, but the uh, but the the uh, nature of the Federal Reserve System is completely different from its original intent. And of course, over time. Uh, institutions uh, all evolve and change. And uh, Ryan, you've written a really interesting book on uh, uh, on decentralization or even secession. Uh, that's that hasn't been the history of the Fed. Of course, it has been a centralizing history. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's gone in the opposite direction, right? And yeah, you're right. They have those they have those votes. And uh, historically, actually, the Kansas City Fed has tend to be their president has tend to be more hawkish. Um, they have Tom Honig, who you may know. Who, I do know uh, him, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's over there in Iowa now, uh, or at least teaches there. Uh, but he was always reliably one of the more hawkish guys on uh, on the FOMC. But, I mean, he first of all, he was only sat on there sometimes. And secondly, what's one vote? I, I mean, it's the whole process is so clearly dominated from Washington and New York that, yeah, this idea... Yes. That's correct. That, uh, but they include that in all their materials. Oh, we have a dual mandate, so we're only following what Congress told us to do, and we're also this highly decentralized structure. And that's just mentioned in their press releases over and over again. And so people shouldn't fall for it at all. <laughs> dual mandate in the statute is actually a triple mandate. There's three mandates, uh, which are stable Prices maximum. Well, you, you should the Fed should run policy in order to try to achieve uh, maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. It is the thing. Now, uh, these days, the Fed does not talk about achieving stable prices. Just the opposite. Uh, they have this term, price stability. Price stability. It's much more waffly term than stable prices. We understand what stable prices means. And over average, uh, on average, over time, prices stay more or less the same. That would be stable prices. They have defined price stability to mean a, a stable rate of inflation. And they have committed themselves to 2% inflation a year, forever. So instead of committing themselves to stable prices, uh, which is what the statute says, you'll never find this little difference in any in any Fed material. They committed themselves to perpetual inflation uh, at a rate of two percent. Well, uh, at two percent a year, what happens to prices in a lifetime? Let's say a lifetime is eighty years, more or less. The answer is they quintuple, they quintuple. And then you get some, uh, in my mind, uh, very uh, foolish people saying, well, it's hard to get inflation down to 2%, let's just make it three or four. If you do the compound math to what a 4% compound inflation does, it gives you wild runaway inflation in the course of a lifetime. And, and it, what uh, uh, but somebody like uh, Ludwig von Mises or Friedrich Hayek, or maybe you and me would say was, well, how about zero on average? Well, and that's what the statute once said. In the 80s, the statute said, oh, you got to get the inflation rate down to zero by 1988, I believe it was. That's right. They gave him 10 years from 19... That's exactly correct, right? They gave. They said stable prices... And by the way, the goal is to get inflation to zero by 1988. Well, they've forgotten that. Instead, they have they have committed to perpetual inflation. Well, that, that's really a, a, a huge and radical move. They also can, made themselves the uh, the manipulators of the mortgage market. This was a, a really I mentioned before two and a half trillion dollars of mortgages on the Fed's balance sheet. What's the Fed doing becoming a housing bank? Well, it justified it by the fact that there is, it was an emergency. So they were going to buy him for the housing emergency. 
I think we're working on a piece together about how you do things in the emergency and then you have to make it go away. <laughs> but they forgot to make it go away. So they just made their mortgage portfolio bigger and bigger. And in doing that, uh, they completely distorted the housing market and, and uh, financed and helped uh, run up the, uh, uh, the obviously non-sustainable bubble in housing prices. Well, that's because they've got these mortgages on their balance sheet, which in my view, they should not have. And I think the one important financial goal and political, let's call it a political economy goal for the Federal Reserve, should be to take their mortgage portfolio back to zero, which is exactly where it was from 1913 to 2008. Zero. Well, that brings us back to this issue then of the bankrupt Fed. Yeah, well, not right. All right let's be is... careful. They're not bankrupt. <laughs> bankrupt, you know, bankrupt <laughs> is a legal state where you have declared that you need protection from your creditors or your creditors have, have taken you over and you are in the hands of a federal bankruptcy judge. Okay, so they're not bankrupt. All right, our negative cash flowing. Negative Fed. cash flow, <laughs> yeah. negative capital. That we call that technically insolvent. If your capital is negative, the, the, the right tech, technical financial term for that is technically it's so. It means you, you owe more than you've got in, in assets. People who defend the Fed. And I think an important takeaway for our audience here then is that to keep in mind that this mortgage debt, and you mentioned this, but it, it describes so much of our problem. And it, it's it's the same problem as the old savings and loan yes. implosion. Well, yes. Is they got, it's even the same sort of debt, the long-term debt. They got heavily. Not sort of. It is precisely. Right. The same day. Long they got term into these long term mortgages. mortgage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and so that's unresponsive to current moves in interest rates. However, what the Fed is paying out to depositors, which is the member banks, right? The that is responsive to short term moves yes. in interest rates. Yes. So as you say, they're paying out more now, but they can't expect any new big inflows of money because they're so deep into these longer term mortgage. Right. Loans. So this is a really important point. The Fed made itself and not only into a giant bank, but it made itself into the biggest savings and loan in history. Precisely. <laughs> I mean, they have the exact eight, two and a half trillion dollars of their balance sheet, which is a pretty, pretty big number all by itself, is precisely the same as a 1980s classic s &L. And of course, here in Colorado, the Silverado Bank, uh, Neil Bush's oh, yeah. operation, very famous, just down, you know, not not far from where I've worked in my lifetime. Uh, they, they, the building's still there. I think it's a tough shed building now, uh, the tough shed on the top. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the question then is, and I think we will wrap up with trying to, to explain why this matters. So the... When you've noted in a couple of your articles, right, is I think one issue we've, we've mentioned here is that, okay, first of all, this money is no longer, there's no longer remittances going to the Treasury. So there's lost money there. The deficit gets bigger. It's actually this uh, uh, SNL-like financial speculation done on the Fed's balance sheet is losing money and it's costing the government money. And how much are we talking about here? Like, uh, you know, we, we have, say, a, a two, a two, if we have a trillion, let's just use round numbers, we have a trillion dollar deficit. I mean, is this a significant portion of that? Or is it just one more thing contributing to the, the federal deficit? If you measure it in operating terms, it's, as I said, $100 billion a year. So that'd be 10% of a trillion. That's, that's very material. Uh, if you and measure it in uh, mark to market loss, uh, but that and the, and the trillion dollars will move into the Fed's operating losses month by month, month by month over time. It's it's not just an imaginary number because every every month, if you're got income of two percent and expenses of five, you keep losing it little by little, and you don't want to sell out of your position because you don't want to take the loss on the market price. So you're stuck, uh, and it, it so it, it's uh, making the finances of the government worse. But much more important than that 
is it is that it is a uh, a, a way to distort financial markets with this with this huge basically unlimited uh, financial enterprise which prints up as much money as it wants that printed money becomes either bank deposits or currency in circulation it's about, uh, but it's mostly deposits and borrowed money uh, and it has tremendously distortionary uh, effects in, in financial markets and therefore in the value of assets uh, and in the uh, in because they have used it to suppress interest rates on the uh, on the returns that are available to savers on their on their money that they deserve a fair return on and they have instead have been basically expropriated by the Fed uh, and uh, through its inflationary effects on depreciating the money that everybody has so these are hugely uh, uh, important effects and hugely important issues. And I'll, I'll just mention there's also a, a serious constitutional issue here in doing all this. How much should the Fed be able to just do this on its own? And how much should it need the approval of the Congress? In most countries, Many countries have inflation targets. In most countries, it's, has, it's an agreement takes between the central bank and the government, that is to say the parliament, uh, or the, the ministers who represent the parliament. In this country, quite astonishingly to me, the Fed just announced we, we are going to commit the country to perpetual inflation. To two percent forever. I, I think this is a huge uh, political and constitutional issue. Why, where do they get the uh, the arrogance to think they could do this on their own? Well, what's the end game here then, Alex? I mean, they, they've they've got to come up with money to make good on the interest they have to pay. So they've got to just create more money. And as you mentioned, that devalues the dollar. It's It hurts everybody's pocketbook. They, a regular person now facing a higher cost of living. And as you said, 10 years are going to go by before <laughs> before a lot of this... Uh, well, before this... all of it rolls... Well, not all of it yet, because the mortgages will still be there, or some portion of them will still be there. Yeah, so it's all... I mean, we're talking about a several-year long problem here. Yes. Right. So how do they get out of this? Or do, is it just going to be a decade or more of pain and and incredible inflation and, and who knows what? Well, it will give us a lot to write about and discuss over the next couple of years, Ryan, as we go forward. <laughs> uh, it's hard to see the, the way out to me. Well, I guess we will have to cover this in more detail as time goes on. <laughs> Maybe we'll know a little bit more about what they're thinking in the future. Uh, and I, I think it is, as people who study finance and economics, it is actually, unfortunately, an exciting time. Because when everything's going well, it's not that interesting to comment on or analyze but things aren't going all that well now. So it's very interesting to look at and analyze and see what new disaster awaits. Very true. I'll give us a, a parting thought on that. The, the greatest book on banking, and the, maybe the most influential, at least on central banking, is, is Lombard Street by Walter Badgett. And there is a, a chapter in Lombard Street with this most apt title, to, given your the comments you just made, right? which is, and Lombard Street means, well, Lombard Street in, in London meant the same as Wall Street means to us. It is why Lombard Street is often very dull, but occasionally extremely <laughs> excited. Yes, I do think that's going to apply here a lot in the next year, if, and much longer, really, when you uh, really start to dive down. So thank you very much for joining me today, Alex. We'll, uh, we'll wrap up for this episode 
But yeah, well, I mean, just listening to this, I think there's a wide variety of topics we can go into a little bit more detail. The history of 2% inflation, uh, the legal history of the uh, the Fed's mandate, all of that sort of stuff, I think most is all just stuff most people don't know anything about. And I think we can discuss in uh, more detail going forward. So thank you if you're listening for joining us on this edition. And uh, we'll be back before too long with some more here on the Fed Watch podcast. Have a great week. But I'll make a living just where I don't know Cause I'm busted I'm broke No bread I mean like nothing